Obviously, the environment we just talked about, the environment can also cause depression. Chronic stress tends to do that. Acute stress, most of us can handle. Our bodies are made for that. We're made, we're kind of geared up to handle a hungry lion standing in front of us or to handle, you know, one bad day at work or something. But ongoing, chronic stress, whether that's poverty, whether that's, you know, Hurricane Katrina coming through, wiping out everything you have, and now you're just completely homeless, have nowhere to go, that's a pretty chronic stressor. That's going to go on for months for these people. There's going to be a lot of depression coming out of that. Any of us, if you stress us enough, any of us, I don't care what our genetic makeup is, there's a big, big chance we're going to get depressed. So stress in the environment is incredibly important. Um, interestingly enough, there are some uh, neurologic illnesses that we all think of as neurologic, which they are, like Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, stroke, and uh, multiple sclerosis. These type of illnesses damage brain cells, okay? All in different, you know, parts of the brain are in different ways. But when you damage nerve cells or brain cells, um, there's depression that goes with that. All of those illnesses have a certain degree of depression. MS, interestingly enough, has the highest. 60% of MS patients, multiple sclerosis patients, get depression. We, uh, we have done studies to show that that is not just because the person finds out they have MS. A lot of these people, before they even know they have the illness, they get depressed. It's, part of this, it's from the damage to the brain cells is what's causing that. So that's another cause. Uh, female hormone imbalances is another cause of depression. Um, thyroid problems, if your thyroid is low, that can cause depression. Um, especially in the older, pe older people who don't eat real well, things like uh, folate and, and vitamin B12 deficiencies, those can cause depression. And uh, what am I missing? I think I pretty much covered it. Anybody think of anything else that I missed? Does it all sound reasonable? Have you guys heard of some of that stuff before? Okay. Um, so with all these different things that can cause it, obviously you've got to realize that the more of those things you have, like if you have a genetic makeup for depression, or you know, puts you at higher, higher risk for depression, plus a stressor, plus then on top of that you have a stroke or something like that, I mean, you know, that's the highest risk person right there. Um, now, any questions about any of that stuff so far? Okay, let's talk for a second about how does depression look in different subsets of the population, okay? So in, in men and women, how does it look differently? I sort of alluded to the fact that men don't come into your off, don't come into the doctor's office and say, and, and break in tears and say, Doc, I'm depressed. They don't do that. Why? I mean, it's not because they don't feel like doing it, I'm sure. And I, I have had guys in my office cry, and Mr. Rogers can attest to the same thing. But, uh, but it's much, it's our society, I think. I think our society says it's not kosher for a guy to cry. You just don't do that kind of stuff. Women, it's okay, but for men, it's not. That's, our, that's all our society. But in any case, men come in, and they're, they complain of something else. You know, it's physical, or it's, a, it's an anxiety symptom, but it's not depression. Until you get, again, the spouse in there, and they tell you the truth. But um, interestingly enough, women, before the age of, before menopause, before they go through menopause, you guys know what menopause is, right? Women, for sure, women. <laughs> do, do the men in the room know what menopause is? Where, where the female hormones start to cycle, start, start the, the ovaries start to sputter. And so they put out a little bit of female hormone, estrogen and stuff, but then they, as, they get, as the woman gets older, usually around the age of 50, these hormones start to, start to die, start to, to diminish, okay? They don't get, there's not as much of them. Um, before that age, before the age of 50 then, on average, women have a two times higher risk of depression than men. Now, we don't know why that is. Is it because they live a more stressful life? Women would probably say yes. And, you know, there's a lot to that, especially historically. Um, but it's probably not just that. If you think about it, any time a woman's hormones change dramatically, there's a higher risk for depression. Premenstrually, you know, every month before, before menstruation, sometimes women will get depressed. Uh, there's a certain subset of women who get depressed with that. Postpartum, after a baby is born. There's dramatic change in, in, in uh, female hormones at that point. And a lot of women, you've heard about Brooke Shields. She had, uh, and I guess she was the one that went back and forth with Tom Cruise about whether there's a real thing. Is it? Let me tell you, there is a real thing. She, she's right, there is. And, and it's not uh, the stress of, of the childbirth. It's not just that. That probably adds to it. That's the stressor. But there's something else, too. It's probably the hormones. And then around the time that the woman's going through menopause is a higher risk period. But after the age of menopause, Equal incidence of depression between men and women. Kind of neat, huh? Kind of interesting. It's got to have something to do with hormones, at least in my head. That, that's the only thing that, that could be. Um, 
when it comes to suicidal things, men, I should say women, are more likely to attempt suicide, so they do it more often. Men are more likely to actually commit suicide and kill themselves. And the reason being is because men tend to be more violent in general. So when they try to attempt suicide, they do it by running a car into a tree or shooting themselves or hanging themselves. I mean, it's very, it's a violent manner. Women, overdosing and cutting on their wrists or cutting on themselves in some way is the number one way that the top couple things that they do to attempt suicide. And so typically the men have more lethal methods. That's nothing to be proud of, men, okay? That's not such a good thing. So those are some sort of differences between men and women, but now what about different populations? So like children versus elderly. I sort of alluded to the fact that elderly kind of present with depression, not so much, again, with the tears and with depression, saying I'm depressed and things like that, but they certainly will have a lot of physical problems. The gentleman I talked about, I'll give you a little story about this one, and it's nobody from around here, so it's not, I'm not betraying any confidentiality, but this gentleman had a lot of GI problems. So he lost 53 pounds in four weeks, and what happened was he had a lot of pain. He had some ruptured discs in his back, tons and tons of pain, couldn't seem to get any relief from the pain, slipped into a depression, lost 53 pounds, and of course the doctor was concerned, put him in the hospital, and did a whole bunch of workup, looking at his GI tract, thinking is there cancer, you know, what's going on, couldn't find anything, finally referred him to Mayo. They admitted him to the hospital with that degree of weight loss too, and they did a big workup. They couldn't find anything. Finally somebody thought maybe we should call a psychiatrist, maybe he's depressed. Comes in, he's depressed. Put him on medicines, he starts to gain his weight back, he starts to eat again, the GI symptoms go away, and now he's not depressed anymore, and he's doing fine. So depression, I mean, don't let it fool you. If you have an elderly family member, and they're not eating, and they're not sleeping, and they're complaining over and over about something, lump in their throat, can't swallow, can't eat, bowels aren't working, whatever it is, those are the classic ones. I've seen that over and over again. Those things could be depression, probably are depression. And not that you shouldn't work up the other stuff. So certainly if you need to, if the doctor says let's go ahead and do a scope and look in the belly, let's do a scope, look in the colon, whatever he says, you go ahead and do that. But if that stuff's all normal, you've got to think about depression, guys. You've got to. You don't want to miss that. Children, they can also, they also don't tend to present with these classic type symptoms. I mean, they don't come in usually crying and say I'm depressed. What will they do? Younger kids cling to their parents. They don't want to leave their parents' side. They refuse to go to school. They may feign illness of some kind, or even have like these GI symptoms and headaches and things like that that I was talking about. Sometimes they get fearful their parents will die. And it borders on almost a psychotic fear of that. You know, there's no real reason that they would think it, but in their head they can't get it out of their mind, you know, that their parents may die. The older kids, though, they start to act out in school. You know, they'll be more angry, more irritable. They'll get in fights. Of course, they won't be able to concentrate very well in school. A lot of trouble with relationships with, you know, with other kids. That's where the fights come from and all that. So these are some of the differences between the different populations and how they might present with depression. Does any of that stuff sound familiar? 